hold on to your butt. Thanks for joining us today for a debate style discussion that we are affectionately calling Hold On To Your Butts. I'm Tom LaRusso from Xbox Research. And I am Ian Livingston from Blizzard Entertainment. Like any good debate, we have a statement to start from. So today's statement is, the future of user research in gaming is to empower everyone to conduct research and create people-centered insights. This is a hot topic in the Grux industry right now. It's something I had a chance to discuss with Ian about a year ago when I visited the gorgeous and sunny Blizzard campus. Uh, we covered a lot of topics around UR and UX, and this was pretty much the only one we didn't agree on. So we thought it would make for a fun debate. So here's how this talk's gonna go. Uh, first, we're each gonna give a short opening statement uh, outlining our positions. And then we're gonna deep dive into a bit of a discussion. Uh, we're gonna ask each other some questions based on what our uh, intros were. Uh, and our discussion and, and our discussions over the last couple of months. Great. So let's get started. Ian, the floor is yours for your opening statement. So user research as it is today is a dying discipline. And that's okay. We need to be okay with that. Let's begin by taking a look at analytics, our sister organization, to get a sense of what I believe needs to happen to user research. 15 years ago, the discipline of analytics was content with designing bar graphs and small, on, on small incomplete data sets. But today, much of that work has been democratized. The analysis is automated and the synthesis has been distributed. Those roles in analytics have evolved and changed to where we now have petabytes of data that are poured over uh, in areas like machine learning and big data analysis. We need to realize that there's no future where there's an army of researchers running and controlling every aspect of, of what we consider to be research today. That's just not realistic. Research is a craft, no doubt, no doubt. Uh, it's, it's a skill set that must be honed and it must be developed and continually learned, for sure. However, we need and must seek to trivialize, normalize, and generalize the work that we do today so that our partners can bring our work into their processes. We must encourage the great minds in this field that are here today to go beyond the impact that they have and to explore the future of researching games. The complexity of games is vast and of tremendous cultural relevance. So I say to all of you, uh, the usability study must become what jump cuts have become to editing, accessible and vastly overused. Maybe you feel threatened by the notion of having those who are not trained to do research, do research. However, that's kind of the order of things. Calculus was the forefront of mathematics hundreds of years ago, but now it's taught to most high school students in America. Obviously, not every student will understand the complexities, but to assume that they can't smacks of hubris. And thus, we shouldn't try. It's natural that over time we become better at teaching things and that they become more simple. And that is where we find ourselves today. I don't want to be running the same usability study 20 years from now. I learned to do it from a book, I did it, and then eventually I started te teaching individuals to do the same. Why can't we teach others to do the same? Sure, they may struggle, but they can engage and empathize and have access to the findings immediately. That is how we create positive change. Thanks, Ian. That was very provocative. You made some great points there. And I don't know about you, but I got a little tightness in my chest hearing that you are is dying. So, uh, so now it's my turn to give you the opposing view. Up front, I want to admit that I love the statement in this debate. I think it's bold and it's forward thinking. I think it shows real leadership, uh, but I don't think it's the right plan. I think there's some real risks, and I think more than that, the intention is good, but I think it comes from a place of immaturity and even doubt about the value of user research. First off, let's address the idea of trivializing the basic methods in user research. Ian mentioned usability. I would throw in interviews, short surveys too. So I agree 100% with Ian that we could teach people to do this, and I agree 100% that they would probably do fine most of the time. 
But in our role, we use those basic methods of our discipline for more than just data collection. We use them to build credibility with the team. We use them to get in early on in a project. Uh, and we also use it for the very practical reason that we train our more junior researchers. So if giving that away doesn't really advance our position, it kind of undercuts the foundation of what we do, even though we can teach somebody else to do it. Um, now, I mentioned that I think democratizing research comes from an immature point of view and even doubt. I know Ian is anything but immature. Um, but I, And I know we've all felt this sense of being less than or not having a big enough role at the top level decisions of making a game. I certainly know that I've had that feeling. So I think that would lead us to think, oh, we have to make everyone a researcher. That way they will finally appreciate us. They will finally understand us. They will finally trust us. They will let us play in the big leagues with the designers and the developers and the producers. And that way we can have more impact on the games and features we're building. But I do not think a place of feeling less than is a way to push forward and really push uh, the discipline of user research. I think that answer of feeling undervalued doesn't mean we should go devalue ourselves even more. We shouldn't treat our craft and resources as something that we can just teach others to do and that they can easily just go off and do for themselves. So now that's the argument against, right? It's easy to argue against something. So what would be the alternative? Um, how do we save research from that dire fate that Ian predicts? I actually think the path forward is through more partnering. So data is everywhere, as Ian mentioned. We're not the only ones who listen to users. We're not the only one with insights, you know, far from it. So to me, the answer is not to find the people who don't have data and then go train them how to have data. The answer to me is to partner with the people who have data, the community managers, the quality teams, the marketing, data engineers, anyone who is actively listening to our customers and creating insights to help make your game better. And when I say partner, I mean really partner. I don't mean just show up to a meeting. I mean defining common research questions, creating shared goals and success metrics, OKRs, even pooling resources. I think that's really how we scale. And that's how we can make sure user research continues to thrive and grow in the next few decades. So with that, we are going to start our Q&A. All right, Tom, that was good. That was good, um, very interesting. I, I do have, you know, my, my first question for you. Um, you mentioned that doing these simple things builds credibility uh, with the teams that you work with. And I totally agree with that. That's, I would say that's 100% true. Um, do you, do you not see a time where that credibility is simply assumed um, that we don't actually need to build it from scratch with the, the folks that we, that we work with? Oh, I think that's a great question. I think we have come very far um, in building credibility with our teams. Um, but the teams that we work with can be new. We can have new people on the teams. Uh, when we work on titles or entertainment features, right? they can be in new spaces. Um, where the first thing you do want to go off and do is do user interviews or short surveys or usability studies, like you mentioned. So even if that credibility is assumed, what are we doing during that part of the project? Um, and I think maybe we can also, I know I said credibility, but how about building relationships with the team? How about new PM showing up or new producers showing up that you actually just have to get into rooms with and show value? All right, so my question to you would be, how do we do it? Let's say I do agree. I do like that. I love that calculus metaphor, right? And especially jump cuts, because I use jump cuts all the time. There's a lot of jump cuts in this video that I edited. Um, but how do you think we do it? How does a user research team train other people to do what we do and still do our job? What does that transition look like? I, you know, I think that that is a really good question, but I, I, I actually don't think it's it's that far off of, of the situation now. I think um, it would, and I, I am speaking for folks who uh, perhaps are, are listening to this, who who are, you know, the the only researcher, the only UX designer who's who's doing research um, on on their project or even at their studio. Uh, and I think that they they probably find themselves um, in that situation where they they were already doing this work, where uh, they're roping other folks into into helping out with with a study. They're kind of teaching people how to. Uh, help moderate or recruit or, or even do some data analysis. Um, I think in order to make that that happen, to be part of the, the process, I think um, it just becomes uh, uh, part of the general uh, training program for, for anybody who uh, becomes an employee at an organization, especially larger ones. Um, 
I, I, I don't know how it is at, at, uh, at Microsoft, but um, there are internal training channels um, available at most organizations. Um, and building out uh, a repository of, of you know, user research basics, I think, would be, should be part of any good um, design training that, that takes place. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. I think the idea of having a training program, uh, you know, kind of a basics of, of user research when people come in to join the company is fantastic. But I still don't see how someone's going to monitor it, uh, make sure that people are still going through that training, that when they go out and do the user research and run a usability study and come back, where's the quality control? I mean, we can absolutely teach somebody how to do something once, but two, three years later at a studio, who's going to kind of oversee how it's all going. We know it's kind of easy to kick something off, but what about the maintenance and the quality control of, of a training program like that? I, I kind of view this as, as like the evolution into, into like an internal consultancy type uh, exercise where uh, researchers um, have that knowledge and that expertise and can support um, designers who are, who are running their, their, some of their own, own work. They can act as a bit of a quality control. They can review um, some of the findings, they can review study designs, things, things like that. Um, perhaps even participate in a, in a couple of the interviews or, or the usability studies to, to help uh, get folks just off the ground. Um, I think there's ways that uh, this can become, uh, like I said, a consultancy or, or you know, a pseudo-mentorship type thing um, where you're engaging in the process, but just more as a, as a light touch rather than a a full, full-on engagement. I'm curious why you feel that expanding the space would be immature or or limit our seats at a leadership table. So that's a great question. I know it sounds bad to say it's immature. I don't actually think it's going to limit our seats at the leadership table, but I think the motivation for us is immature. And I'll tell you why. And this is probably the part where we find out I have a little chip on my shoulder about this, but. I don't see designers coming and trying to empower me. I don't see producers trying to scale out their low-level planning work to me. I would love that. If a producer came and said, I'm going to teach you how to be a better producer so you can go use it in your user research discipline, the next day I would drop everything and turn around and teach them user research, right? So I don't see the mature organizations that are out there trying to vend out or scale by giving away their work um, because they have a confidence in what they're doing. They're like, I'm a producer. I need more work, so I'm going to hire a junior producer. I'm not going to go give my user researcher a bunch of producing tasks. Okay. That's, I, I, I can kind of see your point. I, I'm not sure that I, I agree with that, that sentiment. I, to me, um, and I, you know, I, I'm curious what you think about this, but to me, the idea of finding a place where uh, you have the confidence to to say, let me show you how to do this, because this is something you you should or could be doing um, yourself. This should be part of your process. I I I don't really want this to sound like kind of a gotcha um, on 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 this topic, but uh, I I mean I, I participated in in your your GDC uh, like research uh, boot camps, and they were absolutely fantastic, but they weren't necessarily geared to just researchers they were definitely targeting designers um, and you and you're you're telling me that you know you're training you, you go around and and, and 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 teach and train people how to do this but presumably that isn't wholly for advocacy there's there's an expectation that in that training there's you know an ability that's being transferred as well or am I am I missing no that? absolutely you're right. You can find us, you know, me and a couple other people saying, here is a way to do it yourself. I forget what we call it. I think it was do it yourself or quick and dirty, some bootstrap, something like that. Yeah. Um, absolutely. And I think, yes, part of it is for evangelism. Part of it is gained, you know, aimed at people that don't have researchers and don't have research in their org. Um, because I do believe we need more people just getting user feedback into their products. But it's probably about half and half um, in terms of evangelism and like, hey, here's the stuff you could be doing, and then as soon as you do it, you're going to want more, and you're going to want to hire somebody to do it. Okay, so for my next question, you know, I can concede that you can teach someone to do a usability study uh, or a short survey, but we all know there's like the technical element, and then there's the bias. Now, I myself was in a position 
where I was designing a UI and testing the UI. It was very difficult. And this was after years of being a user researcher, right? So how do you account for that uh, and the fact that a lot of our role is being objective? That's, I mean, that's, that's a hard question um, because, I mean, I suppose if I, if I could give you a definitive answer to that, then I'd be like, done. This, this, this conversation is over. I solved it. Uh, I, you know, I, it might sound a bit cliche to say I, to me, it's, it's, it's training. Um, you know, how, how do we as researchers manage our own bias? I guess the, the main two ways are we argue that we're not necessarily uh, involved with the product. So we, we have less bias um, when we don't, we're not necessarily precious about it, but you know, I'd argue that maybe that isn't necessarily true. A lot of teams have uh, embedded researchers who work closely with, with, um, you know, designers or programmers or artists every day. And mm -hmm. while they may not be directly designing it, um, they are building a very tight relationship with those individuals and they become invested in, in, in the outcomes and, and making sure things are, are successful. So, you know, I, 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 I think we have that bias ourselves in those situations, or at least we have to be very aware um, of that. Um, and then, like, like I kind of alluded to at the start of my answer, I think um, the, the first step is, is teaching people to be aware of it. Um, I do think, you know, training in, in all pieces is, 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 is necessary for this, this approach to even you know, even to be entertained properly is, is that you have to, you have to have people um, learn about their biases, recognize their biases and, and, and try and manage them. Um, but I, I do think it is something that, uh, that, that could be um, taught out for, for a lot of people. Yeah, I, cause I definitely agree with the teaching part. And even if they were doing it over and over to kind of get used to it, I guess I worry about the other factors coming in, right? So if I sit in a meeting I know it's my job to try and represent how that study went, but the person next to me's job is to get it passed through the milestone or to get the next check to come in or whatever that motivate to lower the bug count, right? Instead of adding to the bug count, which I'm going to do. I, I do think you can train people out of bias, but their job is to go get something done. Our job is to try and represent the user and, you know, represent the data. I think there's, you know, the, the idea of, of somebody you know, not being able to, to be objective. Um, I think there's some, some pros uh, in here that, you know, I, I have to kind of imagine um, as well. So, you know, uh, somebody who, who, so first, first pro, um, if, if you're, if you're doing this, it kind of illustrates some degree of, of uh, institutional maturity in that um, they are willing to slow down long enough to, to execute this this thing, um, whatever, whatever kind of study it is. Therefore, presumably they're going to wait for the results because they're engaged in participating in the process of, of, of getting the results um, versus a situation which I know many, many researchers find themselves in, which is, you know, the results don't necessarily come fast enough, even when you're working at your fastest and a decision is made independent of whatever the results say. Um, and, you know, I, I, I could see you know, I could see that's the situation that, that I just described as being a, a plus, uh, where they're, they are forcing themselves to slow down, um, independent of whether or not they're biased to the result, I think is something that um, could be, a, you know, a positive uh, in that scenario as well. I'm, I'm curious why you're worried uh, that there's a risk to devaluing um, the work that we do and the jobs that we do. Um, when anybody can do it. Yeah, I mean, I think that we are coming to the table with a set of skills, like we talked about bias, um, you know, sampling, uh, statistics, just understanding the, the theory behind the user research we're doing, right? So as a researcher, when I join a project, that's what I'm bringing to the table. If as a researcher, I'm joining a project and I say, great, the first thing I'm gonna do is teach everybody to do this thing, that it took me years to train to do myself, that I have 20 years experience to do, that I love doing, and we're gonna teach you how to do this couple of things in you know a day or two. So if you give me a day or two, you guys can go off and do it for the next year and I'm gonna go and do my work. But if the more they get used to doing that themselves, the less the skill, the rigor, and all of that comes into play, 
So essentially, for so much of what we do with so many games, it is those basics. So if we teach anybody how to do a short survey, we can say, oh, survey writing is easy. I can teach it to you in six hours. Now, maybe asking somebody about satisfaction is easy, but then when they want to ask the next and the next thing, just the quality goes down and it's going to cause more headaches. Now, my prediction, and again, maybe I'm a little bit cynical about this, is that whatever view you have of what we would be doing instead, it's actually going to hurt us down the line because we're going to be doing something where we say, well, how do we end up with this? Oh, those people went out and asked a three-question survey that was not great. They did the set of interviews with the wrong people or, you know, again, assuming best intent, they just didn't define their users up front. So, I mean, we could just go down the checklist of everything we do, even in a basic usability study. And if we do the thing that I did in GDC is say, okay, great, in six hours you can go do this, I think that's actually going to catch up with us uh, and cause us more headaches because we're working in those orgs. So to put it another way, you know, you had mentioned something like data science. I've seen things like localization. I've seen other disciplines where, or quality for sure, where we get it down to such a kind of piecemeal level and such a kind of formulaic level where they go, okay, great, now that we do that, we can go hand it off over here. We can do it for half the price, for half the people, and it will just outsource it essentially. So I worry the more we package it up and tell people we can do things in a couple of hours and anybody can do it, they'll go, well, great, I'll just hire three of you over here to go do that work. Uh, and I don't think that's the way we want research to get done. That's, I, you know, I could, I, I see that, that point. I'm, I'm not sure if, if I see that ultimate reality. Like, I feel like there's, there's a degree of, 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 I mean, there is definitely a heart, a degree of, 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 of hard uh, skill associated with it, it being able to do uh, good research. And I, I suppose, um, my impression would be that uh, people would recognize the challenge of, of doing it and would recognize uh, as they become more familiar with, with the process that they would they would recognize their own limitations um, and, and, and want to call in the experts uh, when they when they need help. Um, I would love I, yes, I would love to think that as well. And that's that's part of the reason why again, I think and I know that I work in a very collaborative way. And certainly at Xbox, we work and bring people along for the ride. And you do see that, right? We do get a lot of emails like, oh, I wrote a survey. I know it's terrible. You guys are the experts. Go do it. Um, but that's also because we are doing the surveys for them or doing the usability study. So I, I would love for that to be true. Um, I don't think there's a lot of great history in any industry about people recognizing their limitations and then going for the experts uh, <laughs> in a way that we would want to. But you could probably come up with some good examples. I, I, you, you did say something that I thought was kind of interesting. The, the, the idea of, um, you know, having somebody who's gone to school for years, uh, you know, somebody with a master's or a PhD, um, and, and then bringing them into a, a position as, as a, as a junior researcher, um, and then asking those individuals to run usability studies for two, three years. Um, do you not see that as, as devaluing or demotivating um, for, for individuals? Yeah, I mean, that, I do think when you put it like that, it is a good point, right? Like, I mean, I think they should be doing basic research and getting their reps because I do think it's a difference. Um, so I don't think the alternative of on day one, they show up and they sit in a studio leadership meeting and try to figure out what the next game we're going to be building, right? So I do believe, you know, I mentioned in my opening around training, not that they have to do 100 usability studies. They can come in and do all kinds of different interesting things. But the usability study, the short survey, the user interview lets them get the reps and build the relationships with the team and see how the industry works. So it's not so much sitting there and you know running sessions, but you have to sit down with the team and say, great, what are the 50 things you're working on? What do you need help with right now? Oh, the five of you don't even agree. Okay, let's go figure that out, right? Because you know there's a lot of politics, there's a lot of communication, there's a lot of soft skills. Um, and so that's what we use a lot of those more basic methods to do for training new researchers. Um, so I know in our conversations, you know, you've talked about the fact that having a big army of researchers just really isn't feasible, right? And so we have to empower others and we have to scale. I see a really great path of growing the amount of researchers and the quality of researchers, the seniority, the position, so, 
I don't know why you kind of see this cliff that we're all going to fall off. Why can't we just incrementally grow our numbers and get bigger within companies? I mean, it seems like design did that. It seems like data science is doing that right now. Um, so why not? Why not an army of researchers or at least more in 10 years than there are now? Um, I, I, I do think that uh, there, is, there is a finite size uh, for any research team at, at an organization. Um, you know, I think it, it, it grows with, with the products and it grows with um, the, the maturity of, of the organization. Um, but I, I, think we, I think we can agree that there's, you know, depending on the, on the size of the organization, there's probably a finite size that the, the research team needs to be um, to support it, even if they're doing all of the, the work themselves. Um, but I think the more important piece of, of the question that you asked is, um, you know, kind of around the, the idea of scaling. And I, I, I bring it back to the, the kind of the initial answer that, that um, I feel uh, that, you know, these disciplines grow and evolve over time, right? And, and I, I think there are pieces of what we do uh, every day that are, that should be ultimately fundamental to a, a design process. And you know things like usability, uh, I think, should be you know a fundamental skill set for a good interactive designer, um, and that you should be able to do some form of of either structured or guerrilla or um, effective uh, user research as a as a designer, both in games or or apps or or web. Um, and I think you know with the rise of of disciplines like UX design. Um, we're seeing those those pieces being baked into uh, the work that they're doing, and in many cases, I think um, those those roles themselves uh, are, you know, better users of um, the the work that we're doing. They ask better questions, um, and they're able to take people who like like you and I, who are professional researchers, uh, and they're able to utilize us better by asking us um, to to deal with the tougher questions. Uh, that they they recognize they can't deal with themselves. Yeah, I think I think that makes a lot of sense. I really do love your jump cut example because I can't argue with it because I love mm -hmm. the fact that you know being a video editor doesn't mean you have to be a video editor now and have a video editing setup and have gone to school. You can just go into the video, right? And I think you're saying as design evolves, people can make a wireframe, but that's not design's main job. But there's also that view of saying, well, then let's just at least keep it within the research realm, right? Let me be the researcher and I'll come back to you with the usability study and I'll, you know, I'll figure out the right way to do it because, again, I kind of have that quality control. So within the discipline, you can have levels and we can do some of the fun things like, uh, you know, remote testing or even bending it out or working with partners who specialize in usability. But at least it kind of comes through us um, because I can't argue with the fact that these things would evolve. Um, but but it could kind of evolve through us instead of giving the chunks away. So I would love to see a world where we are doing more different things and we are evolving and we are giving away the jump cut, but we're not really giving away the jump cut. We're just bringing them jump cuts more efficiently and effectively because I can't argue with the evolving part. I don't want user research to look the same way in 20 years that it looks now. And I definitely don't think it looks the same way from 20 years ago. So I think we're just having this debate around the, the direction or how we go off and do it. Yeah. yeah, and I, you know, I, I, I feel like what you just said kind of agrees with with my my premise, um, which was, you know, we, we, we have to evolve, um, and that we have to make things more accessible. But the things that we need to make um, accessible are, you know, maybe maybe up for debate, or the process in which we we, we do it is up for debate. Great. Well, did I did I win? That, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if you won, but that might actually be a really good question to end on because we, you know, we kind of agree. We both want to see it evolve. Uh, we both have different thoughts on doing it, but I really appreciate being able to have this back and forth. It's always fun to pick a hot topic in the industry and hash it out and hear different views. I'm sure there's, there's, there's lots that uh, we could continue to discuss here, and I'm sure uh, once, we, once we jump into the, the Discord channel, there's going to be a bunch of people um, arguing about the things that we said. Uh, here. So, all right, for everybody who's listening, um, either in the Q&A uh, for this conference or on Twitter, you know, feel free to kind of reach out to us. Um, we're happy to, to con continue this dialogue and this discussion.
But uh, with that, I will say goodbye and thank you all for listening and enjoy the rest of the conference. Thank you. Take care, guys.